I will call to order our Tuesday, January 19th board meeting. Due to current conditions and mitigations placed on our region by the Illinois Department of Public Health, and in accordance with guidance provided by the Governor's Office, the DuPage County Health Department, and Neighborhood 203 Legal Council, this meeting is being held virtually. Current Tier 2 resurgence mitigations require meetings to be limited to 10 individuals. Public comment is accepted electronically, and all comments received are posted in board docs under public comment. Since 5.30 p.m., the board has been in closed session to consider the following. Discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act for purposes of approval by the body of the minutes. The appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district or legal counsel for the district. Litigation, when an action against, affecting, or on behalf of the particular district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal. And the selection of a person to fill a public office as defined in the Open Meetings Act, including a vacancy in a public office, when the public body is given power to appoint under law or ordinance. I will entertain a motion to come out of closed session. So moved, Wonky. Second, Gerke. A motion is second or heard. Please call the roll. Leong? Aye. Gerke? Aye. Fitzgerald? Aye. Wonke? Aye. Cush? Aye. Kosminski? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Good evening and welcome to our January 19th board meeting. Our mission is to educate students to be self-directed learners, collaborative workers, complex thinkers, quality producers, and community contributors. Please call the roll, Mrs. Patton. Board members present this evening, Kristen Fitzgerald, Donna Wanke, Charles Cush, Paul Leong, Joe Kosminski, and Christine Gerke. Student ambassadors present, William Ma and Shay Doshi. Okay, please join the Board of Education in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of, the of the United States, States of America, America and, to and to the republic for which it stands. stands. One, One nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. Okay, we have reached the point in our agenda for good news. And I'll ask uh, Seneca Mandini to share some uh, really fun news about uh, one of our programs. It is really wonderful news. This is a huge shout out to teacher Greg Ditch. He is a career technology teacher in Naperville North, who along with his students are becoming the local media darlings of Naperville. They appeared on CBS and um, that story was picked up around the country. Uh, NCTV has also just profiled them and what they're doing is pretty awesome. Uh, Mr. Ditch is collaborating with carparts.com to have his after school program rebuild a wrecked Ford Mustang Carparts.com sent most of the parts necessary to rebuild the car and have facilitated a relationship between our students and NASCAR team Front Row Motorsports and driver Michael McDowell. The Napro North students participate in two virtual Q&A sessions with the team at Front Row Motorsports. And um, they're hoping that when they get this car done, they're going to be able to display it at Autorama and to participate in precision driving events. The car will feature the number 203 on the door along with blue and orange graphics. Uh, I really want to congrat congratulate Mr. Ditch. He has just done a phenomenal job. He's uh, worked with these students. Um, Mrs. Posey and I have had a chance to get involved in the Q&A and it's just super impressive what they're doing and socially distanced and getting different groups in. So it's just been really fun to watch. And I'm sure that their media stardom is not done yet. All right, that is indeed good news. Okay, uh, we have reached the point in our agenda for public comment. The Board of Education welcomes comments from the public at its meetings. We regret that due to guidance received by our DuPage County Health Department consistent with current mitigations limiting in-person professional meetings to 10 persons, we are meeting virtually and thus unable to receive public comment in person. However, all individuals who wish to submit a public comment are able to do so by email as has been our practice at our vir virtual meetings during the pandemic. These emails are included as a part of the record of our meetings and can be accessed under public comment on our website. We will now read the public comments aloud. Individuals will be identified by first and last name.
Comments by individuals shall be limited to three minutes. If an individual has submitted multiple public comment emails, they will be combined and limited to three minutes. When three minutes have been reached, Mrs. Patton will announce time, signifying that the three minutes have been reached. The complete comments will be included on our website as a part of the public record of tonight's meeting. If a person is representing multiple individuals or a group, their public comments shall be limited to five minutes. Okay, we're ready. Great, our first message comes from Diane Doing. She writes, uh, pediatric vaccines are years away. This is in response to public comment at last board meeting. There is no intention for pediatric COVID vaccinations for to be available this year. They are still in the early phases of testing. We cannot wait for this. Also, as a physician, I am disappointed by the physician representative quoting inaccurate false negative rates regarding saliva testing. It's an appropriate means of testing, but our experts should know this data. It's readily available. Tests that rely on high viral load to trigger a positive result can certainly have false negatives in early stages of disease. Again, this is expected, but should be understood. Okay. Our next message comes from Abby Walter. Dear members of the board, as a teacher at Naperville North High School, I am very concerned for the health and safety of the students and staff in the district. With COVID numbers much higher than they were when schools were fully closed last spring and the UK variant about to take hold of US communities, I fear that any face-to-face -face learning could lead to an outbreak in the school and in the Naperville community. According to the CDC, the UK variant is much more transmissible and is likely to be the predominant strain in the United States by March 2021. With the first case of the more contagious strain recently identified in Illinois, it is only a matter of time before it reaches the Naperville community. Why push for in-person learning now with numbers on the rise and the UK variant headed our way, especially when the vaccine is so close to being available to many in the community? It is likely that we will have to resort to remote learning once the variant takes hold of the state which will cause yet another disruption to the students' learning. Would it not be better to provide our students with the continued stability and routine of online learning? I would love, love nothing more than to be able to teach my students in person, continue to build relationships and watch them grow. But once hybrid learning begins, the students won't be receiving the same quality of education as they were last winter, since we will have to be socially distanced, hidden behind masks and forced to rely much more heavily on technology. They'll be extremely impersonal and that is not how I teach, nor how the students prefer to learn. When in person, I will not be able to give students high fives as they enter my class, have private chats with them about their personal lives, or give one-on-one -on -one help to my students. While I obviously cannot high, I, while I obviously cannot high five my students through Zoom, providing individual support or talking with students privately is something that is easily achieved over Zoom when everyone is remote. The way my classroom is set up right now for hybrid learning, I won't be able to step one foot away from my desk without coming into close contact with the students nearest to me, meaning that my any conversations with those students is going to be publicly conducted in front of all their classmates. The students will not be allowed to have small group discussions, share materials, or laugh over small talk with their classmates. School in the hybrid model is not going to be the panacea everyone is expecting it to be. I deeply appreciate the district providing testing to students and staff in the community. I do, however, feel that this testing should be mandatory for any individual entering the building. If we want to have a true gra grasp of how the virus is affecting the community and allow for maximum safety of the, the, those present in the building, then weekly testing should be compulsory, not voluntary. While I would love for things to be normal so that I could be in the classroom with all my students again, I recognize that this is not what is safe for the community at this time. I feel that continuing remote learning will be the least disruptive educational path and is, the best, is in the best interest of everyone involved. Sincerely, Abby Walter, Spanish teacher, Naperville North High School. Okay, our next message, Amy Vogel saying, Dear Superintendent Bridges, Cabinet and Board of Education, first I'd like to recognize Seneca Mundini for what I can imagine must be grueling work reading all of these comments aloud. Should future meetings remain virtual, it would be great if there were a sign-up system for community members to call in on Zoom and make their statements. It seems dissonant that it is currently considered unsafe for the board to host in-person meetings at Naperville Central High School, but a week from now, hundreds of students, teachers, and staff will be filing to the same building. Illinois has recently confirmed its first case of the more contagious B1717 variant of SARS-CoV-2. The CDC has predicted that this strain will be the predominant one spreading throughout the United States by March. Additionally, according to IDPH, as of January 15th, the case rate per 100,000 is 330 for DuPage County, and the test positivity, positivity rate is 9.5%. Both of these numbers are well within the substantial range. I am concerned about the district's new metrics presented at the January 4th meeting for a few reasons. One, at the January 4th meeting, test positivity 
was in the high moderate range and the case rate for 100,000 was in the substantial range. But the new metric community positivity rate or case rate over 100,000 was reported as being of moderate concern. Why was it not flagged as, a, as being of substantial concern? Two, sufficient staffing and adequate PPE do not negate high community spread. These are supports that, that must be evaluated once community spread is at, is at a manageable rate. Three, I worry that the opt-in nature of the surveillance testing undermines its validity as a metric. Four, the district needs to be transparent about how they are applying these metrics. What combination of metrics would trigger extending the adaptive pause? While there may be some need for, for flexibility, obscuring this process, process breeds mistrust. As a community, we recognize the value of in-person learning, but at this point, the benefits do not outweigh the costs. Physical presence in a school building is not what makes in-person learning special. When we are not living through a pandemic, classrooms are spaces where students can huddle together around a whiteboard to solve a problem, or a teacher can guide students toward the right answer with a subtle tap of a finger on a paper. This is not what the classroom would be like when students returned for hybrid instruction. It won't be business as usual now with masks. School will be a different place, one of constant vigilance and distance, still interacting through Zoom. We must also consider how this will be equitable experience for the students learning at home. I believe the best way to serve all students is to continue growing into enhanced e-learning until we can have a true return to the classroom. It is my estimation hybrid learning will introduce more problems than it will solve. I know that many students want to be back in school buildings and their families want the same. That is what I want too, but only when it is safe and when my physical classroom can be the welcoming space of community and create that it is meant to be. Unfortunately, now is not that time. We can help all help usher in that time by making decisions that limit community spread. Sincerely, Amy Vogelstein, she's an ELTBE teacher at Naperville North. Okay, our next message comes from Mary Beth Baskin. I'm happy to see Naperville 203 finally moving in the right direction with allowing children to attend school in person. Can you share with the public what success we need to achieve in a, in, in a hybrid model to move to a five day a week in person schedule? Glenbrook North, Glenbrook Brook South and Arlington Heights students are moving to a five day a week in person instruction. At a minimum, we should be watching these schools, talking to their leadership and mirroring their plans. We are spending $2 million on surveillance testing. This is not a small number. I would hope this kind of financial commitment can get us further than eight periods a week of in person instruction, with one of those being lunch. Okay, Lisa Shamrock. Dear Superintendent Bridges, Cabinet and Board of Education, I hope you will join me in thanking Seneca Mundini for her perseverance in the arduous task of reading the public comments aloud. I am very concerned about the transition to hybrid learning when Illinois recently confirmed its first case of the more contagious B117 variant of COVID-19. Yet the district does not have any firm dates to begin vac vaccinating school staff. In my view, the benefits of hybrid learning have not been clearly communicated, nor do they outweigh the risk Risks. In person learning during a pandemic for half my students at a time will not improve their SEL and academic development more than continue, continuing fully remote learning because of students learning, because students learning experiences will not resemble their pre pandemic school days when they used to share and learn together in cooperative groups. Students who have opted to be in the building will continue to use Zoom in order to, in order to include those who are remote. I will, I will still be on Zoom in order to provide feedback, feedback discreetly and to allow students to share their questions and concerns privately since I will not be able to get close to my students for quiet conversations. I also expect to have to spend a considerable amount of precious time I have each day with my students to monitoring safe dis distancing and proper mask wearing, cleaning desk and other high touch services and maintaining the tech setup required for live streaming. These are necessary tasks which will dis distract, detract from the time I can dedicate to meeting my needs, students' academic and SEL needs. Sincerely, Lisa Shamrock, French teacher in April North. Okay, Brooke Ulrich writes, Dear members of the board, I am a teacher at Naperville North High School and I'm very concerned for the health and safety of the students and staff in the district. With COVID numbers much higher than they were when, when schools were fully closed last spring and the UK variant about to take hold of US communities, I fear any face-to-face -face learning could lead to an outbreak in the school and the Naperville community. The UK variant in the, of the virus is particularly concerning. There are fears that it will be the predominant strain in the United States by March 2021. It is only a matter of time before it reaches the Naperville community. I am concerned about the push for in-person learning now, especially considering that numbers are on the rise and the UK variant is coming. It's not a matter of if the UK variant comes, it's when. It is likely, likely that we will have to resort to remote learning once the variant takes hold of the state, which will cause yet another disruption to the student's learning. Every time we make a change, we need weeks to fully adjust. Choosing to go in-person feels at this point 
feels like we are choosing to cause more stress and strain on our students because we will inevitably need to go remote again. I fully believe that in the value of teaching in person, the reality is that school will not feel normal for students who are attending in person. Students won't be receiving the same quality of education as they were before we were mandated to stay home last March. We will have to be socially distanced, hidden behind masks, and forced to rely much more heavily on technology. Students will be taught by a teacher who will also be behind a computer and a monitor. I will not be able to move freely throughout the classroom for safety reasons. It will be impersonal and there will be a slight fear of each other due to fear of spreading the virus. I appreciate the district providing testing for students and staff in the community. This testing should be mandatory for any individual entering the building so that we have a true grasp of how the virus is affecting the community and allow for maximum safety of those present in the building. While I would love for things to be normal so that I can be in the classroom with all my students again, I recognize that it is not what is safe for the community at this time. I feel that, that I feel like continuing remote learning will be the least disruptive educational path and is the best interest of everyone involved. Sincerely, Brooke Ulrich, who is a Spanish teacher in April North. Okay, our next message comes from Mandy Burt. Good evening. As the district presses forward with the transition to in-person learning, I sincerely hope that the same level of urgency will be applied to coordinating the opportunity for all district staff who wish to receive a vaccine to be able to do so in a timely manner. Some nearby districts have already put together interest surveys and outlined tentative plans as, they state, as the state and region both look to vaccine group 1B. And I hope to hear from our district very soon about how they support a vital step and what we sh would surely help keep our schools open and our communities safe. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration. Amy Perry writes our next message. Good evening to the school board and community members. As a teacher in the district, it is incredibly difficult for me to sit back and see the plan for hybrid in-person learning moving forward. Metrics in the area continue to rise and there are new strains impacting the spread in our community. And we don't yet have a clear timeline for vaccinations among school personnel that could drastically lessen the community spread of COVID-19. Please know I respect and understand the hardships families have, for, have faced by having students at home and not in school buildings. It not only puts a strain on parents and caretakers, but it puts a strain on students and their social interactions and sense of normalcy. I believe many community members urging in-person learning think that by getting students back in the buildings for in-person learning, quality of life will improve and will feel, norm feel more normal. I'm here to say that in-person hybrid learning will feel completely the opposite of normal. Instruction will still need to take place using their Zoom platforms as well as have students learning from home, either for online learning or, or as their day off days for the hybrid schedule. And we'll need to share all lesson materials over Zoom and Canvas. The teachers are not going to be circulating the room, checking in on students, crouching down next to students at their desk to engage in close proximity. We're going to work to keep distance for everyone's safety. From what we've been instructed as teachers, students at the junior high level aren't going to have normal passing periods, be able to use the restrooms as, le as leisurely as they would like, or eat snacks, grab drinks in a normal fashion. Students will need to stay at their desks and limit interactions in general, but instead of being safe in the comforts of their own home. They're going to be at a desk in a mask all day. For passing periods, they'll be expected to walk in a single line, file, single file line around the building for four minutes while teachers sanitize the classrooms in preparation for the next class. I miss my students. I wish it were safe and appropriate for us to rush back into buildings and resume life as we once knew it. No teacher got into this profession to teach through a computer screen, but what so many think the hybrid plan and bringing students into the building is going to fix it is not going to be the reality. Now is not the time to, to be pushing for this hybrid model. The protocols moving forward are going to feel confining and frustrating for all involved. In some teachers' schedules, they won't have the proper amount of time to switch gears between classes or even tend to their own personal needs of using the restroom because their passing period time will be spent sanitizing chairs, classroom services before students come in for the next class. With the block scheduling, many teachers have days have days of block of back to back to back to back classes without any breaks, especially now that they're in charge of sanitizing the room too. The rush to get students back is not worth the potential risk of harming our students, our teachers and staff and our community at large. I urge the school board to reconsider this timeline and closely examine why we are pushing to get students back in the building right now. Thank you for your consideration of this issue. Okay, our next message comes from Dana and Michael Umbenhauer. They write, District 203 Board of Education members. It was brought to our attention last week that a state representative of many 203 families, Ann Stava Murray, proposed legislation to remove resource officers from all Illinois schools. She has currently tabled the bill, but it should be expected that this legislation, legislation will likely be put forth again in the future. Resource officers are a positive addition to our schools and provide many services to our students beyond their day-to-day -day safety. We are fortunate to have amazing resource officers in our District 203 schools 
We would like to see the Board of Education support the continued role of resource officers in our 203 schools and reject any proposal to remove them. The safety and well being of our students should be the top priority. Thank you, Dean and Michael Ubenauer, parents of 203 students. Our next message comes from Lynn Hanley. Dear members of the Naperville 203 School Board and Community, I'm a teacher at NCHS and, and an NUEA member. I'm writing this letter to urge you to suspend the district's plan to move, for, to, move to hybrid learning on January 25th. Despite the deep desire of many within our administration and community to return students to classrooms, I understand the community's impatience with remote learning and the desire to return kids to learning communities that are shared with their peers. I share with many of you the belief that in-person learning, at least the pre-pandemic model of it, is superior to what we can offer online. However, a move to hybrid instruction is unsafe at this time, and it does not allow teachers to safely support students within our community who are most in need. According to the DuPage County Health Department, the COVID-19 transmission level in our community remains substantial. And on Friday, Governor Pritzker announced that, mo that the more contagious B117 variant of COVID-19 has been detected in Illinois. The CDC predicts that this variant will be the most pre prevalent in the United States by March. In Europe, schools are closing in response to the spread of this variant, according to a January 16th article in the Wall Street Journal, and the consensus that children are, considerable, are a considerable factor in the spread of COVID-19. On January 12th, the Montreal Gazette published the findings of a Canadian study in which researchers concluded that the transmission of COVID among school-aged children is not a consequence, but rather a de de determin determinant of a general level of infection in surrounding communities. These recent developments make returning to in-person instruction unsafe at this time. Once students are in the classroom, they will spread COVID-19, including its new variant to one, to one another, their teachers, and back home to their families, despite the mitigation efforts put in place by the district. It would be much safer to wait to return to classroom until vaccinations are available to teachers and to vulnerable members of our community. Governor Pritzker announced in his press conference on Friday that the vaccinations for 1B, which includes teachers, will begin on January 25th. He anticipates that once President-elect Biden takes office, Illinois will, will receive a greater quantity of vaccines from the federal government. Vaccines will become more readily available, not only to those who work in education, but others in our community, including those over 65 and with medical conditions that put them at high risk of severe complications or even death from COVID-19. These vaccinations are literally weeks away. Returning students to classrooms without vaccination risks the health and even the lives of not only the teachers, but other vulnerable members of our community who come into contact with our students, including the grandparents on, on whom many families rely on for childcare when students cannot be in school. Finally, the return of most students to classrooms next week would limit what District 203 teachers can safely do to help our most vulnerable students, those with failing grades or who are otherwise truly unable to learn remotely. Many of these kids are students of color, students with IEPs and others who, for whom the district's recent work in equity has been conducted. I had the privilege of having a few of these students in my classroom this week in groups of one to three students at a time. I was able to work one-on-one -on -one with these students as well as I could, as I could across six feet of distance correct misunderstandings and deliver focused support in making up missed assignments, assessments that are critical in their academic success. And with only two to four of us in the room, I can easily monitor mass wearing time. Okay, the rest of this message will be included in board docs. Okay, our next message comes from Lindsay Kasten. She writes, hello, Mr. Bridges and Mrs. Fitzgerald. I've emailed you a couple of times, thanking you for the incredible amount of work and stress you and the rest of the BOE have been under during these very complicated and difficult times of COVID-19, especially for keeping teachers, staff, and our children remotely for their safety. We have been so grateful for that. I am sure that you have been bombarded by emails, phone calls, et cetera, from families regarding the upcoming transition to the District 203 hybrid model that is quickly approaching. We have decided without any hesitation to continue to keep our three children, fifth, sixth, and eighth grade remote at this time. Our fifth grade daughter is extremely high risk having terminal neuromuscular disease, spinal muscular atrophy, the number one genetic killer of children due to respiratory failure, but her disease does not affect her intellectual or social emotional functions. She has been full-time in gen ed classes since kindergarten at Prairie Elementary, our other two children are at Washington Junior High. Our kids have definitely had to adjust to remote learning this school year, but are now very used to it and are doing quite well. However, after looking at, at what our three children's schedules will be once the hybrid model starts, we are very concerned and upset that it appears they will only be receiving half the education that they would typically receive prior to COVID. This has actually already been the case for our two junior high students since the block schedule was implemented months, months ago to prepare for hybrid, which did not happen at, at the time due to the rise of COVID cases, but the half day block schedule has continued despite everyone remaining remote. In junior high or sixth and eighth graders have only had remote school hours until 12.50 p.m. every day, except Mondays for quite a while. No junior high student 
have been receiving remote instruction in the afternoons, and this will continue once the hybrid model starts. And we have no idea why this is the case. Why have our junior high children not received their typical nine periods every day in the past months like they did at the start of the school year? Our fifth grader has been in her remote class for the entire school day, but now we see that our fifth grader who is assigned to the PM online only schedule will only have a special and then independent learning during the AM session and vice versa for the AM students, hybrid or remote. We were under the impression that the entire district had spent a lot of money to allow every classroom to have new technology, including live streaming devices so that those who are either remote only or for our hybrid students during their non-hybrid half of the day would still virtually be receiving full instruction through live streaming. My husband is a fourth grade teacher in Elmhurst 205 attempting a hybrid model for the second time this year, but unlike April 203, the teachers continue to teach all students hybrid and remote all day through live streaming, whether students are physically in the classroom or not. The school day has been slightly shortened so that the kids do not have lunch and recess at school, but all academics are being taught to all children all day, every day of the week. There are no independent learning block times as they've learned, like so many of us parents kind of, kind of common sense, that it is a complete waste of time and lack of education for our children as students hardly do any work during these times. Like I mentioned, we have a 100% support of your incredibly difficult decision during this pandemic, but we now feel that our children are being deprived of half of their educations. For our family, this is absolutely unacceptable. Obviously, we all know there are two COVID vaccines that are, that are FDA approved. However, no, the remainder of this message is also important. Okay, our next message comes from Katie, Katie Jabbar. She writes, our family is looking forward to hearing announcements about what we can expect for summer school options. We feel that robust offerings would be appropriate to help recover some of the learning loss that has been evident as a result of the pandemic. We hope that these plans will begin, begin being shared with district families soon so that we may make the decisions appropriate for our family's needs. We hope we can rely on D203 to provide what is needed. Thank you, Katie Jabbar. Okay, our next message is from Ronnie Ben David. I'm glad hybrid is starting soon, but I'm worried about the proposed optional COVID testing. Why aren't you making all students and staff take the COVID test regularly to keep everyone safe like they do in, at UI, University UIC, UIUC, sorry. If you make it optional, mainly those who are careful will get tested and those who aren't will most likely refuse to be tested getting the rest infected. Thanks, Ronnie. Our next, next me message is from Sarah Forster. She writes, good evening. Just over a week ago, I shared the news of in-person school with my sixth grader. Overcome with relief and a tinge of disbelief, she wept. Our family is thankful that District 203 has finally made the right decision to allow all students the right to choose whether to attend school in person or to participate remotely. It is a very good start. With the adoption of surveillance testing and expectations of mask wearing, there is tremendous opportunity to grow our comfort with the environment grow our comfort with the environment. However, this is just a start. To be fully successful, we need to aspire to, to moving to full day school, whether in, hi in hybrid or in all student mode as soon as possible. Arlington Heights District 25, Glenbrook District 225 and Community District 300 have already moved to full day four to five days per week school. Neighborville D203 needs to follow suit. In District 300, a community district almost double the size of District 203 Lunchtime logistics have been addressed by administrators and architects using, using all available space and plexiglass dividers. Whether full six feet distancing is unavailable, lunchtime would not, be, would not preclude District 203 from having full-time school. The district must assess every student as soon as possible and carefully evaluate whether all remote school may remain a viable education format, as opposed to in-person traditional learning for the remainder of the 2020-21 school year and the foreseeable future. Academic, mental, social, emotional, and physical health concerns all matter in designing in the future of education in District 203. Thank you for your time. Sarah Forrester, District 203 parent. Kristen O'Brien writes our next message. How will outbreak me metrics be communicated to families? Are you communicating all outbreaks even if less than 10 people are involved? Are teachers and staff members receiving adequate PPE and vaccinations before schools are opening? How will the district handle wrongful death, disability, and negligence lawsuits? Thanks, Kristen O'Brien. Stephanie Siska writes, Dear BOE, can you please address the timeline and planning that has been done to achieve full day in-person instruction? I understand hybrid is just starting, but that should be a transitional phase and not a permanent solution. Thank you, Stephanie Siska. Christy Hughes writes, I'm a District 203 parent of three children, kindergarten, second, and third grade. Please provide the community Please provide the community the plan for all of Naperville 203 students to go fully in person five days a week. Thank you, Christy Hughes. Lisa Byrne writes, 
please provide the community the plan for all of Naperville 203 students to go fully in person five days a week. Lisa Byrne. Kim Bierman writes, please provide our students with a full five days a week in-person school option like they deserve. Kim Bierman. And Cedor writes, good afternoon. We are very excited about our students getting back into their buildings next week. Please continue to work on plans to return all students who so desire to full-time in-person school. I recognize this first step must occur, but we need to keep moving forward to reach the ultimate goal of five full days of school every week for everyone. Thank you, and Cedor. Jill Sunderbrook writes, could you please provide the plan for all of Naperville 203 students to go fully in-person five days a week? Thank you. Signed, Jill Sunderbrook. Kathleen Zielinski writes, please provide the community the plan for all of Naperville 203 students to go fully in-person five days a week. Signed, Kathleen Zielinski. Katie Donkowitz writes, number one, why can't the children that have chosen to go back in-person elementary school attend a full day session? while those who chose to stay remote do the full day remote like they are doing now. And if it is because there are too many children choosing to go back in person and you feel it cannot be done safely, why can't the elementary school still have a full day of learning? With those who are remotely continuing as we have, we have been, and those who choose to go in person having half of their day remote and half the day in person. I understand having the core math and reading in person is the focus, but that could be adjusted either weekly or daily to give those in-person equal opportunities. For example, the AM could have reading and writing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and reading and writing in the PM Tuesday and Thursday, with math, math also alternating. This would prevent inequities for students' instruction. All of the technology is a place for this to occur, so the logic doesn't add up. The half of the day where the children aren't live with their teachers, many will just flounder. Having an instructional aid checking on them will do little to no good. I've seen it over the past nine plus months. Lisa Grimms writes, as we thankfully return to limited in-person learning this week, I want to emphasize that the return to full five days, five days a week is still the goal. This hybrid is better than remote for my kids, but until we are back full time, it is merely putting a bandaid on the, on the injury already sustained. Lisa Grimms. Hey, Gracie Libby writes, hi, today I observed a young early childhood student just sleep on the bus with her mask on. I asked the bus driver to immediately remove the mask according to CDC guidelines. I'm not sure if you are familiar with this, but a child falling asleep on the bus home from Anne Reed is not an unusual occurrence. While today is not my daughter, it, it was not my daughter asleep. I have woken my daughter several times over the past two years after the bus drive, her bus drive home, home, and have seen other cheap children asleep as well. This is a very big concern. I have with masks for this population of children. It is not safe for them to be unsupervised on a bus with their masks on. Please review and discuss this policy. She also sent a second message that said, thank you to the district for your work on getting children back in school in person. I look forward to hearing a plan for families if they so choose to send their children back to the classrooms full-time this school year. Please provide a plan as soon as possible to the, board, to the board to consider. In regards to the board opening, I also ask you again to consider choosing an applicant who is sympathetic to the need to offer families school choice. Thank you, Gracie Libby. And that concludes our public comments. On behalf of the whole board, we want to thank all of those who submitted public comments by email or have contacted the Board of Education. Reading your comments is a vital part of understanding the very challenging issues faced by our community. Due to the volume of emails, there are times when we are unable to respond in a timely way. However, all emails are read and valued greatly by the Board of Education. Issues raised in public comment will be taken under advisement by the Board of Education, but will not be discussed this evening. Issues raised during public participation may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff. The superintendent is the board's designee to coordinate response to public comment and he will apprise the board accordingly. As has been communicated by our superintendent, answers to questions raised in public comment will be posted on our website under frequently asked questions. This will conclude our public comment period. So we will then move to our monthly reports. Listed in board docs are our monthly reports, treasury, investments, insurance, and budget. Does any member of the board have questions regarding our monthly reports? Okay, seeing none, we will move to our action by consent and I will entertain a motion for the consent agenda. I don't see anybody's hands. Who was our person who did bills and claims? 
Okay, Paul, there you go. Sorry, I just didn't see your hand. Hello. Oh. I was responsible for reviewing bills and claims. I'd like to thank Tracy Laflame for working with me and answering all of my questions. I move approval of warrant number 1030247 through warrant number 1030650 totaling $16,701,201.32 for the period of December 22nd, 2020 to January 19th, 2021. And the items on the consent agenda. Uh, and the other items on the consent agenda. Okay, a motion has been heard, a second? Second. Second, second from Kosminski. Motion is second or heard, please call the roll, Mrs. Patton. Kosminski? Aye. Leong? Aye. Wanke? Aye. Gerke? Aye. Fitzgerald? Aye. Cush? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. So we will move on in our agenda to item eight, communications. Item 8.01, written communications listed in board docs are our Freedom of Information Act requests for your review. And so then we will move to item 8.02, student ambassador reports. And who would like to go first, William or Shay? I'll go first. Okay. All right. So for Naperville Central, eighth grade orientation uh, for extracurricular events and various courses was held virtually on the Wednesday and Thursday before this past Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, additionally, the semester is going to end on this Friday and students just received their schedules last Friday and optional hybrid learning will begin the following Monday. During second semester, the Monday schedule will start at 1025 a.m. and students will have half an hour of synchronous learning for each class. So that's a little bit different than how Mondays have worked for this past semester. Um, there's also tours for eighth graders being held on Saturday and Sunday. And current high schoolers also have the option to walk through their schedule at the building as well. And this is largely because a lot of this year's freshmen may not have actually been in the building before due to online learning. Uh, there's also optional conditioning for athletics, which is opening this week at NCHS. And as for final exams, there are no preset final exam days this semester, which is different than past years. Uh, they are optional for teachers. And just to give a rough idea of what that looks like, this might be different for other students depending on what classes they have. But for me, it's roughly 50% of my teachers who have assigned final exams. Um, so yeah, that's about all I have for Naperville Central. Thank you for letting us know what's happening at Naperville Central. Shay, tell us what's happening at Naperville North. Sure, so we got a lot of the same things happening that William said. Um, we have our freshman tours starting tomorrow, or starting today and tomorrow. Um, the upperclassmen will be showing the freshmen around. And then we also have finals coming up. I think that teachers have done a good job balancing um, not completely traditional finals. I have some traditional finals, some project-based finals, and some classes that I don't have a final exam in at all. Um, so I think that that paired with all the experience that we've had over the last 10 months of e-learning will definitely contribute to a solid environment for our second semester, be that through um, the executive functioning lessons and organization things that we have planned for teachers and students, or um, the great like improvements that we've made in socio-emotional um, help and athletics and stuff like that. So I think we're all definitely looking forward to second semester. Thank you for that report. We're looking forward to second semester as well. And thank you to the many people who I know are helping out at those high schools, giving those tutor tours, all those upperclassmen and other students who are helping out with that. I know that's really appreciated by our new students. Okay, so we will go on in our agenda now to item 8.03, superintendent staff school report. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a couple quick updates before we go into the return to learn update. Uh, just uh, for our community's information, many of you may have received a talk 203 message on Friday, uh, but also information posted on our website on Friday uh, is an uh, announcement to the community that there's a vacancy on the Naperville Community Unit School District 203 Board of Education uh, due to the resignation of Janet Yang Rohr. Uh, she submitted a resignation to the board secretary on uh, January 12th, 2021. In uh, accordance with recent statutory changes to the school code, 
Uh, the board now has uh, 60 days to proceed to fill that vacancy. I think we had announced previously that it was 45 days, which is what the, the previous time limit was. That uh, statute was updated in uh, January of 2020. The board has 60 days. Um, to, to and so they'll be looking for a candidate to complete the remainder of uh, Ms. Yang Roar's term, uh, which will be up for election in 2023. Uh, residents who are interested in becoming a member of the school board uh, should submit a one-page letter of interest along with a resume uh, to be received by the close of business at 4.30 p.m. on January 27th, 2021. Uh, one-page letter should address uh, interest in becoming a member of the Board of Education, uh, what you think you could offer District 203, and any prior experiences or involvement you have had with the school district. Um, if you go to the website uh, underneath the board news, you can see this full announcement and information regarding the only legal requirements uh, for serving as a member of the Board of Education. Uh, and so information is there. If you have any questions uh, regarding the process, you're encouraged to call the superintendent's office, speak to Mrs. Patton, uh, the superintendent and board secretary uh, regarding uh, this process. But again, it's all posted online. Members of the community are encouraged to apply. Thank you for reviewing that. And the board encourages all applicants who are interested to apply. Okay, and then, uh, you know, Neighborville 203 has been a, a school district where we have been really proud of the work that we have done uh, as a school district and as a community really on our commitment to, um, you know, educating the whole child. Uh, and with the start of 2021, uh, I want to announce that we've partnered with best-selling author and renowned positive psychology expert, Sean Aker, uh, to provide a series of community engagement sessions with activities and resources that focus on positive psychology. Members of our school community will be getting uh, communication from us. I believe it's uh, scheduled to go out tomorrow. Um, and you know, some of what this is going to include uh, is an opportunity to participate in some interactive uh, self-paced videos as well as some live virtual sessions to focus on mindset, uh, increase wellness, foster learning, social, emotional well-being, not only for our students, but for our families. Uh, some of the video series and community engagement sessions will focus on topics like building a, a social connection, focus on anxiety uh, and stress and, and how, to, how to mitigate that, uh, being adaptive in the midst of the, all of this uncertainty and change, and focusing really on a growth mindset. So looking forward to this opportunity for a positive community engagement and participation. Again, be looking for communication. You're on mute. How uh, you can get involved and participate uh, in the coming uh, in the coming days. So, looking very very much forward to this. And with that, we will transition into uh, you know uh, again th thinking of the positive in our return to learn plans. We'll ask the presentation please be brought up. Uh, tonight, we're going to update uh, the community on our return to learn. Uh, this evening's information is going to focus on our current metrics, our plans for surveillance testing an update on plans for distribution of, vac of the vaccine to our employees. It's been very rewarding over the past several days seeing some of our students returning to our campuses in preparation for our hybrid stage. Uh, our schools and the district will continue to share information with our families to help them prepare for the return and the continuation of online learning for those who choose that option. Over the past few meetings, we've presented a lot of information to the board and to the community on our plan for moving into stage three. As a reminder, you can find those updates on our Return to Learn webpage, www.naperville203.org slash return to learn. Several questions we've received are very site or individual specific. So as we prepare for our movement to the next stage, uh, you as a parent are encouraged to reach out to your child's teacher or building administration regarding those site specific or individual questions. You should continue to expect communication from us in the coming days. As just mentioned this evening, we're gonna update you on the return to learn progress. Currently we are in, in, in enhanced learning, stage two of our plan. Uh, we are on track and preparing for our transition to stage three beginning next week. We continue to monitor our local metrics and collaborate with various agencies as we make that transition to hybrid. We are encouraged by the progress we've seen throughout the state and locally. There have been questions about our plan. Uh, we can go back please. Uh, there have been questions about our plan for stage four and moving to full in-person learning for all in five days a week. Under current guidance, that will not occur until the vaccine is more widely distributed or guidance that we get from the Illinois Department of Public Health and the governor's office changes. 
Some also have been pointing to other districts across the state who are offering a five day or full day option for all of their students. I just wanna caution you as you look at what other districts are doing. We've talked about this from the beginning. Each district has to look at its own capacity and ability uh, to offer in-person learning. Um, we anticipate based on our survey data, about 70% of our student population to be in person. At some of our school sites, that number is as high as 85%. Some of the districts that have been referenced as seeing uh, uh, in, more in-person or five days a week full days have less than 35% of their student population actually in person. So fewer students choosing the in-person option allows more flexibility with in-person instruction. Our goal remains to be to return to in-person learning as soon as we can do so within the guidance provided to us by state agencies. We can transition to the next slide, please. And just as a reminder, this is our timeline for transitioning back into hybrid learning. Uh, again, we've had some great activities. It's been uh, fun to see students engaged in uh, transition and welcome uh, uh, events over the course of uh, already even today. Uh, we, so we continue to be on pace for hybrid instruction to begin on January 25th. At this time, I'm going to invite Dr. Igo to update you on current metrics and surveillance tests. As we discussed last time, we have changed the metrics we are, we are monitoring to guide our decisions about in-person instruction. The chart on this slide highlights where each of those metrics are as of Monday, January 18th. Overall, our metrics are stable from our last meeting. Our community positivity rate of 7% falls within the moderate range. With that positivity rate trending down, our PPE and cleaning supplies continue to be adequate. Our key mitigation strategies of wearing the wearing of face masks and social distancing are being, su being successfully implemented within our schools and we are successfully contact tracing when necessary. Additionally, all staff levels continue to be accurate. We have been able Additional information about the new health metrics can be found in the updated return to learn guide that Mr. Bridges spoke about earlier and detailed information about the health metrics can be found on our COVID dashboard. We turn the slide, oops. We've been finalizing our plans for the COVID surveillance testing. As our goal is to have as many individuals participate as possible, our enrollment will be ongoing. In order to enroll, new students or staff will need to complete their consent form and turn it in no later than Tuesday morning by 8 a.m. of each week. New participants may begin testing the following week. Once an individual enrolls in the program, we will be providing them with a test kit that will include all of the materials they will need for 12 weeks of testing. The kit will also include a detailed instruction sheet with a QR code that links to a video demonstration of how to provide the sample. 12 test tubes, 12 small straws, 12 envelopes, as well as 14 unique barcode labels. We'll be collecting those samples once per week. Students and staff will be assigned a consistent day to provide that sample across the entire program. As students enter the building, a bin will be available for them to turn their sample in. If a student forgets or is absent for some reason, they may bring that sample the next day. For any individual whose screening indicates a finding of potential presence of, the, of COVID, the notification process will include a text either later that evening that they, they drop their sample or first thing in the morning, which indicates that their sample came back with a probable finding and that everyone in their household, sh household should remain home and that they will be contacted within the next few hours with next steps. This will alert them as soon as possible to the finding and provide our staff the needed time to connect with them about next steps. Each individual will also receive a phone call from the health office or the human resources, where they will be referred for a PCR test and informed that they and everyone in their household should remain home until they receive the test results. We will also engage in contact tracing at that time. We will then follow up that phone conversation with a letter that outlines the steps to be taken in order for them to return to school. As I mentioned, we'll also be doing some contact tracing for each individual that comes back with that probable finding. We will identify anyone that has been a close contact, which as a reminder is less than six feet for more than 15 minutes in a 24 hour time frame, and they will be excluded from school until we have results from the individual's PCR test. If the PCR test is positive, then any close contact would be required to quarantine for 14 calendar days from their day of exposure. 
This slide shows the implementation timeline for our COVID testing program. This week, we are running a pilot to make sure all systems work and nothing needs to be adjusted. Consent forms for the first week of testing were due today for staff, and we're happy to report that we have 1,265 staff participating, or 65% have signed up for the program. Student consent forms are due tomorrow, and as of 10.30 this morning, we had 2,112 students enrolled in that program. We are hopeful that this number will continue to grow. Next week, staff will begin testing and students will receive their testing kits. The week of February 1st, students will begin testing. Since enrollment will be ongoing, we will also be processing any new participants and providing test kits so that they can begin testing the week of February 8th. We are excited to have the opportunity for our staff and secondary students. We highly encourage everyone eligible for the program to participate. The more participants we have, the greater the impact there will be for the whole community and for our ability to maintain the hybrid learning model. If you've not already done so, we strongly encourage you to complete the consent form within Infinite Campus. In exciting development, oh, please go back to the vaccine slide. An exciting development uh, in regard to our return to learn uh, and obviously for us uh, uh, nationally in dealing with the pandemic is the availability now with the vaccine uh, and the distribution of the vaccine. Uh, we are continuing to partner with the Page County Health Department, which will be the agency locally responsible uh, for the distribution of the vaccine. Uh, the county currently still is in the process of administering vaccines to those eligible in Group 1A. Uh, we know that the governor has indicated uh, availability to Group 1B beginning the week of the 25th. However, uh, the priority for the county uh, will remain 1A until those eligible receive those vaccinations. Just in, in terms of currently uh, in the status of the vaccine throughout our county, uh, for Group 1B, that, uh, that number really is over about 270,000 individuals that are eligible to be vaccinated. Uh, currently, the county is getting uh, a little over 10,000 uh, doses per week uh, with the uh, hope that it will rise soon to about 18,000 per week. So at that, at that rate, really, of the distribution of the vaccine and the number eligible uh, within Group 1B, you know, we're still looking at a 10 to 12 week process in terms of how long it'll take uh, to, to get administered. We are collaborating uh, with Indian Prairie School District 204, as well as local providers to be able to uh, administer the vaccine once it does become available. Uh, the vaccine has to be distributed by medical providers or any of the 120 pharmacies in DuPage County. Uh, so again, we are partnering um, with, uh, and we'll kind of announce those as those are finalized. Um, it, but we are partnering to make that vaccine uh, available at, at our sites, uh, at some of our sites uh, for members of staff once they are eligible. Um, our registration process for staff uh, started today. We opened up our portal uh, and just already today, uh, 1400 of our staff has indicated their interest uh, in participation in the vaccine. So very excited about that uh, and so that we can get moving. So once again, as that becomes available, uh, we want to be ready and to ensure that uh, our staff uh, are in line and able to get that as soon as it's ready. So we can move to the next slide. Please. We will continue to push out more and more communication to keep our community uh, updated about our progress and return to learn plan, frequently asked questions, the website um, uh, and social media are all sharing useful information um, uh, regarding the vaccine. Uh, we, uh, we do need to remain to be vigilant. Uh, we do need to remain uh, up to date with our metrics and, and recommendations that are coming to us from the health department and other agencies. Next slide. Uh, as we stated in the beginning of this presentation, our ultimate goal is for all students to return uh, to full in-person learning once we can do so. Our number one commitment is to keep all people in our organization sell, safe and healthy while modeling and staying grounded in our district mission uh, through the, avail the addition of surveillance testing, the administration of the vaccine uh, on the horizon. We feel very confident that we, can, we are ready to safely increase the number of students in our schools each day. Sometimes we get asked as community members, what can we do to help? What can we do to ensure that we, we are able to maintain this? Uh, again, please continue to file mitigation recommendations that are, are brought to you by the Illinois Department of Public Health. But I'd also encourage individuals who have the availability to check our human resources page uh, if, for opportunities to, to work for District 203. 
There are vacancies that are available, especially looking for substitute teachers. Um, please check the website uh, regarding you know, the, the process for applying for those jobs. Really, in order to ensure that we are able to continue with full in-person, uh, we are going to need your help. And I think another area of support that we could get is um, the uh, uh, the opt-in on the uh, surveillance testing to help us control and identify the potential spread. Uh, as uh, Dr. Igo mentioned earlier, we initiated and launched our, our pilot this week. Uh, a number of us uh, participated in that. It's a simple process, an easy process, and really would encourage you all to, uh, to help us out in that area. So with that, um, you know, members of our team will, will be happy to respond to questions that the board has uh, regarding our update this evening. Thank you. Okay, as, as we prepare to return to Learn in Person next Tuesday, I want to express the heartfelt appreciation of our entire Board of Education to our parents and our teachers. Throughout this time of remote learning, you have worked tirelessly to support our students. You have worked together to overcome whatever challenges were in front of your students. You have reinvented, you have advocated, you have showed our students true strength in the face of adversity. Thank you. To our students, we are so proud of you. This extended period of remote learning was not what you expected or wished for, but you have persevered. We are so excited to welcome those of you who are joining us in our buildings and to continue to celebrate those of you who are joining us from your homes. We know that as we return to learn with some students and families continuing with remote learning and others choosing hybrid, we will continue to encounter challenges, navigate new circumstances and learn together. We are so grateful to be a part of a district where every person in our community is rising to the challenges and working to overcome them together. We know that our continued efforts will be successful only with your continued partnership. I also wanna thank our administrative team for the Return to Learn presentation, but more importantly for their tireless work to make our safe return to schools possible. We know that our community has expressed additional questions and concerns during our public comments. Some of these have been answered in our presentation and some will be addressed by the Board of Education's questions. However, as a reminder, our superintendent will also address these questions and the frequently asked questions on our website. So many of our community members have also sent questions to the Board of Education by email. And I wanna thank our community for their efforts to express their comments and concerns. This is a vital part of ensuring that their concerns are addressed. As a reminder to our community about our own Board of Education process, the board submits many questions ahead of the presentation so that answers to questions from the community can be addressed as a part of the presentation. We also reflect many of these questions during our question and answer period. Please know how much we continue to value your communication and most importantly, your partnership. We will now begin the board's question and answer period. And I will take the first hand. I see Charles. Uh, good evening. First of all, thank you for um, uh, to uh, superintendent and team for the uh, presentation and the update. I really appreciate all the work and effort. And you heard that in some ways reflected in some of the comments from earlier. But um, my question is really around, it's encouraging to see the number of staff members that have, that have opted in for the testing and that have signed up for the testing. Um, I do have a question around, um, if I heard correctly, uh, the number of uh, student forms that we have so far, and I know there's still a little bit of time to get those in, um, is, uh, is a little bit lower than I think we are hoping for. Um, if I remember correctly, the number is about 70% is that we're looking for, 70% of the population to opt into the testing. Um, at what point um, will we, would we want to look at uh, additional measures to encourage um, um, that testing at what point is it is it does it become a little bit of a sense of urgency if the numbers don't get to that 70 percent threshold yeah I think um, just you know it, it, in terms of when you think about the surveillance testing timeline uh, our students are scheduled to begin the testing the week of, of February 1st as Dr. Igo presented so I think you know one of the strategies that we'll have to do is, is up our communication additional communication and as we transition into hybrid uh, with more kids coming, ensuring that they've had the communication and understand that this is an option available to them. Christine, I don't know if there's any additional information that you'd, you'd like to add. Not necessarily, um, but we have had some conversation as we, as we today about what are some of the additional communication we can do. 
we've created a video to kind of help promote that. So we'll be getting walking down that that path of trying to encourage our students to participate. Right. Yeah, I guess um, could you could you speak to the level of criticality? I again, you know, I understand there can be communications that go out, but you know, I know many of the uh, community members uh, watch this meeting. So um, can you speak to the criticality of being able to get to that 70%? It, it just seems to me that having this as an additional mitigation in place allows us to, um, it, it plays a good, uh, an important role as a factor of how we're evaluating, not only returning to learn, but staying in, in the hybrid model and then being able to progress to different stages. So um, can you right. speak a little so, bit to how that works? Yeah, I'll start and then I'll ask Dr. Igo or others to chime in. Um, certainly the more widespread and the more individuals eligible for participation or surveillance testing that actually participate, the better sense we have about understanding any potential for, for, for spread of, of COVID. Reminder, it is surveillance testing, not diagnostic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think, again, we've heard from many members of our community over the past several weeks, the importance of getting back to in-person instruction. We have several strategies, mitigation strategies in place to ensure that we can do so safely. Surveillance testing is one part of that. And again, so if we wanna look at ways that we can ensure that we are able to remain and feel safe about being in person uh, so that we can control a spread, a, a quarantine or isolate individuals who may have a clinical indication of a possible positive test, focus on quick contact tracing, all of which are parts of our return to school matrix, the more that participate, the better. I'm, I'm very encouraged by the level of participation so far by our staff. Again, the process was, was pretty simple, you know, and, and, and I'm, I, you know, I, again, we'll see how this continues to go. Uh, Dr. Igo, uh, what would you like to add? Yeah, I think the piece I would, I would encourage is that it really does provide us an opportunity to help identify those people who are asymptomatic. So we have lots of ways to make sure people who are experiencing symptoms aren't entering our buildings and kind of monitoring, but this just provides one more layer that does that asymptomatic piece. And it really will help us to keep the community and our, our learning environment, you know, less likely to spread that virus. Thank you. I appreciate that. that uh, I'm good with questions for now, Kristen. Thank you. I'm just gonna do a brief follow on. Um, I think we've also provided some more information as a part of this meeting as to the process. At our last board meeting, we weren't really sure if kids were gonna be doing it at school or if they were gonna be bringing it home. It sounds as if you've made the determination that they will be bringing it home so that they can have their parents assist them. They will be bringing it back in. It will be an easy drop off. So that's helpful information to our community. I would also just say as a parent, I think that we could potentially have it be a little easier to sign up. Um, you know, going and logging on to Infinite Campus and finding that survey tab um, might be just, you know, it, we might wanna just like put a link in all of our communications right to Infinite Campus and remind right there, it's in the survey tab because it is something where it's not quite um, as easy as just clicking on the link and getting the form. So that would just be my only suggestion that we, re we really try to up that ease of opting in so that we're able to make it as easy as possible for people to participate in one action. Okay. okay. Thank you for that. Questions from the board. Donna. Thank you. Um, I just want to, I, I heard that uh, our, when we went through the metrics that some of those are changing a little bit and that there's a tab for that. Can we just speak to that so that community members can understand a little bit more about the, and I can understand a little bit more about what's changed and why it's changed in the metrics. Um, so the health metrics that we're using to monitor in-person instruction, we talked at, at length a little bit about those um, at our last meeting where we talked about making a change and aligning to kind of the CDC and making sure that we were following what the best research told us and what we had learned by having some conversations with other districts. And one of the things that we had learned was that there were lots of different, there were two really important things. We needed to be using one of the key indicators from the CDC, which was the positivity rate or the hundred, a number of new cases per 100,000. But we also needed to be pairing that with our ability to implement and monitor those key mitigation strategies. And those key mitigation strategies are wearing your face mask, social distancing, and being able to contact trace quickly. 
um, when necessary. So when you take a look at how we're looking at those metrics, we've really aligned to that, that thinking and that process. Um, and we've kind of provided that information for people on our COVID web website and details about the which metric is where can be found in the return to learn updated guide. Yeah, okay. so for point of clarity, there were, there were no changes from our last meeting when we reported. The change really comes from earlier in the year. Okay, that's what I was misunderstanding. Oh, so. I apologize. Okay, I thought that we had new changes from the last meeting and um, okay, thank you so much. Joe. I'd like to um, just follow up on, on a couple of uh, the questions that Charles asked. Um, regarding that uh, number of uh, 2,100 students, a little over 2,100 students who have um, signed up so far, uh, what percentage does that reflect right now? Because it's not every student, it would only be the ones who are going um, in person. Uh, for... it, it currently represents about 30% of our in-person students. Now that's overall of our in-person students. I've not done it by school. Okay, thank you. Um, and then you mentioned in the presentation that the um, students would be notified uh, either in the evening, you know, which, which is great, uh, or potentially the, the following morning um, uh, about positive tests. Um, would that be before they would get on a bus and get into the school building? Um, yep. That is our, yes, that is our, our, our plan. So the, the company has 24 hours to provide us with those test results. They have indicated that generally we will get them that evening, which is will allow us to send it out in the evening, but sometimes they will come first thing in the morning, which is why we have that clause in there. But our goal is to catch, catch anybody before they arrive at school, which is why we're sending the text if it comes late so that people know that as they're getting up. And that gives us our, our staff time to get to school, get organized and, and start making those calls. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll defer right now. Okay, questions from the board. Okay. I don't see anybody's hand, so I'll go ahead with a few of mine. Um, I did want to question, in terms of the percentage of the students, that's just the uh, secondary students, correct? That we're looking at? So it's correct. the first secondary students, okay, right. Okay, so we definitely have some work to do. We want to try to double that and get a little higher, right? Correct. All right, so um, one question that we had last time, and again, it was it seemed a little bit unclear as to the um, actual like policy on this in terms of the snacks and the classroom. Um, how will that be handled with regard to students eating in class and, you know, or not eating in class and where will they eat? And I know that will be, you know, individual um, places in different buildings, but what, what, what is the general um, way that we're gonna address that? Stephanie or Chuck, you wanna take that please? Sure, I'll, I'll go first, um, Chuck, if you don't mind. Um, so sure, at, the second, at the secondary level, um, the junior highs really, um, their day doesn't, doesn't really lend itself to needing a snack during the day. If a student does need to for a medical reason or, or uh, other reasons, we'll have a designated area. All seven schools have been asked to designate um, a dedicated space where students can social distance and have a snack if needed. Um, at the high school level, our schedule is built such that the majority of our in-person students either have lunch at the beginning or the end of the day and or their study halls early release or late arrivals are also at the beginning and end of the day. So very few students should need that um, opportunity for eating. Um, if they do, again, both high schools will have a de designated space and teachers do have the option of allowing students to have a snack, small snack in class if they'd like to. But again, I don't think that will be um, a highly needed um, option for students because of the way we've set up the schedules. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think the question a couple of weeks ago was specific to secondary, but just to touch on elementary, um, we'll also mirror the, the junior high level. Um, we won't have scheduled snacks in the you know, shorter day, uh, but certainly if students uh, require it for medical reasons or, or simply because they, they just need something in their tummy in the morning, um, the, the schools will have a designated space for them to do that safely outside of the classroom. A lot of our operational and logistical detail in terms of 
just how we run our schools will be communicated by principals at site, by teachers, as our students are starting to come in. So again, there, are, there will be differences facility to facility. We are very clear in terms of what our expectations are and our, our, our staff will communicate that information with our students who have returned to in-learn, okay. returned to person, in-learn and personal learning. Okay, to go to um, the question, uh, uh, one of the questions that we heard a little bit this evening was with regard to um, that still that 1.30 to three o'clock timeframe that we're um, having for students, um, both at the junior high and the high school level. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that works with regard to them being in person during the morning and then that transition to how that will be used in the afternoon? Um, at the junior high and high school level? And is that consistent across each junior high or will, the, will there be some variations? Um, and then how should parents, if they really are concerned that they haven't heard um, in terms of you know, more opportunities, how to communicate that in trust? Sure, of course. Uh, right now, both at the junior high and the high school level, we are concentrating on students who either are close to failing or failing They're in their current content areas as well as students that have not been engaged or have a lack of acceptable attendance levels at both the junior high and the high schools. Um, and then obviously individual teachers, there is some autonomy there given the content and um, the, the, the opportunities for projects and, and other activities that teachers are doing to invite students in on an as needed basis. So not all students have been in. Um, we are very much aware that some of our students are not flourishing in a remote setting and need a little more um, additional one-on-one -on -one time or, or two-on-two time, depending on the standards that they're missing or maybe not mastering at a level that we um, find acceptable. So those are the students right now that we're, we are um, concentrating on. You'll find it's a little bit different at all seven schools, but um, I, the high schools have had hundreds of students in, both because of being invited by teachers who have content specific needs that they need to work on with students, as well as students who have connectivity issues, um, engagement and attendance issues. And so student services at both high schools have also brought in a number of students just to um, be able to manage them and help them get organized with their executive functioning skills and just make sure that they can help them start to get up to speed and be more successful in the remote um, atmosphere that we've been in up till now. Junior high mirrors that as well. They are also prioritizing those students who may be struggling. Um, we're all excited to get some of those students back in person because we know that they need to be with their teachers on a more regular basis in person. And so hopefully uh, we'll see an increase in productivity and success as we move into in-person learning on the 26th. Jane, is there thing, something? You go ahead, Jane. Thank you. One thing that I will add is that um, during that time, there will be some in person, but we also will serve our um, remote learners as well. So um, our teachers have clear expectations of what that time is meant for. And for example, um, sometimes our kids will stay, our in-person students will stay, but they may be um, in a Zoom with an online student as well. Um, that is time for our teacher to do some reassessment. That is time for our teachers just to do some Q&A also with, teach or with students that need additional help. So it looks very different because our teachers are going to be responding to their student needs. Um, but what I do want to ensure and, and follow up uh, with what Mrs. Posey said is this is going to be, this time is for both our in-person students, but also our remote students at home. We wanna make sure that both students um, have access to our educators during that time. That's great. Thank you for letting us know all of that. And in terms of um, parents who might have a concern that for example, you know, you know, there has been a focus on some additional students and they have a concern about their own student and want to communicate that with the teacher and potentially have some of that time. Should they just contact that individual teacher for each Nothing, of Nothing has changed in terms of how we expect and hope our parents and teachers will communicate with each other, whether it's in-person, it's hybrid, any form of learning that we're in. Absolutely, a, a parent who has a concern about their child and their progress should definitely reach out to the classroom teacher. Okay, great. Um, Okay, another question that came up um, as you were talking about the um, 
classroom set up. So um, we were talking a little bit about the people who would be notified as um, if there was a, a positive case or a positive surveillance finding. Um, if we have our, our classrooms and everyone is six feet, it would seem as if even if there was a positive case, it would not be notified as a close contact unless they had been closer than that six feet. Correct? correct. That is correct. However, they would be, will there be a distinction between someone who sat exactly six feet away in terms of a notification, a notification they would receive and someone in the classroom 20 feet away? Or is it just everyone in the classroom would be notified that there was a positive case and that they were not a close contact, but that it had occurred? Yeah, so for students that are in the classroom with a student that tests positive, they will receive an, a message that we call a low risk um, exposure, which means they have spent in, inside with a group of students, although they maintain six feet of distance, they were in, in an indoor space for an extended period of time. And the reason that we do that is we just want those families to be on alert that should, the, should your child begin to show some signs or symptoms, you should not make, you should assume that they might, they, that they've been exposed and we want them to respond to that. It, it's easy to say, I think I have, it's a migraine or I think it's my allergies or I think if they've had a low risk exposure. We're asking that they, they assume that it is not. But they wouldn't be put into the 14 day quarantine unless no. they have a symptom that occurred. No, there's absolutely no quarantine involved in that. It's just a reminder and a, a, to be extra careful and to, to pay special attention to any symptoms. All right, I, that's three questions for me. So I'll go ahead and yield to somebody else um, for some additional questions. Questions from the board. Okay, I don't see any additional um, questions from the board. Um, I did wanna ask a little bit about the um, self-certification process as you come in, um, in terms of for the, um, as students come in, they're doing the temperature, but they're also gonna um, verify that self-certification form. And I know we've got lots of communication going out about making sure parents sign off on that form. Can you just um, let us know, how, how's that going? Do you have everybody signed up in terms of that? And do you expect that should take a lot of time as people are coming in? Or do you think that will be a super quick process? I don't believe there's a process where they're gonna verify the self, self um, the self- Certification. The Thank you. <laughs> I was like, what's the word? Self-certification um, process. So kids okay. are going to do that at home. And if a parent sends them to school, what we're going to do is we're going to validate that they don't have a temperature as they're entering our buildings. And if they are participating in, in the COVID testing, then they'll drop their sample into the appropriate box as they walk in as well. Okay. So you'll notify somebody. They're, they won't be uh, screened to make sure that they have completed the self-certification form. That will be something that their parent is notified ahead you haven't completed this, you need to get this done. Is that right? If they have not done so, if they've not already agreed to do a self, the self, self certification every morning, our health office will be reaching out to those families and reminding them that they need to provide that before their student can attend in-person instruction. If they've not heard from us, then they should assume that they've turned that in and, and all is good. I don't wanna overwhelm our health office with lots of questions of did I or didn't I, but if we don't have it, we will reach out to you. Additional questions? Okay, sorry, Charles. Apologize, I was on mute. Uh, so I just wanna go back to the, uh, the testing again. Um, again, recognizing that there's still time for people to, to opt in and participate. Um, have we heard any concerns that would um, prohibit individuals uh, from opting into the testing? It sounds like the the process that's been outlined um, outside of what uh, Mr. Sterl said in terms of potentially adjusting the link or whatever to make sure that folks are signing up. But um, in terms of the process of testing itself, it's essentially collection of a saliva sample, which is pretty easy to, to provide. Uh, and then that is, so it's, it's, we've done everything. Question is, you know, have you heard concerns from the community around why folks might choose to not opt in? You no, know, I had many questions about testing over, over the weekend. I have not seen any that indicated that people had, nobody's expressed any specific concerns. They were much more about the process and the routine and, and things like that. Um, I, 
I wonder if people were waiting for to kind of get a sense of, we had talked about, we updated our frequently asked question decks with all of those, those procedures. We've also got a video that we'll be releasing soon that, that provides it, you know, how to provide that sample as well as the importance of it. So hopefully those will be some of the reasons um, why people have, you know, once they have that information, they'll, they'll feel a little bit more comfortable um, moving forward. Yeah. I mean, the reason I ask is just because I just want to make sure that we're removing every possible obstacle to make it as easy as possible for folks to do that, given the criticality that Dr. Igo, you and, and, and Superintendent Bridges communicated um, and the importance of being able to have this as another tool in our arsenal to understand the, um, the you know, just to, to surveil and understand uh, as best we can uh, the the, the containment of the virus within the community itself. So. Absolutely. You know, we did have a couple of questions about, well, what about if I get the vaccine? Do I need to? Um, will I, well, you know, those kinds of things. And, and we've got that in our frequently asked question document now, but really important to remind people that because you have the vaccine, that there's no research to indicate that because I've got a vaccine, I can't spread that disease to somebody else. Even I might not get sick, but I might make somebody else sick. So even once people have had the vaccine, we are encouraging them to continue to participate in the testing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any additional questions from the board. So I just have one final question. I know we are all very excited um, about, you know, heading into in-person in hybrid next week. Can you tell us a little bit more? I know we heard a little bit from our student ambassadors, but can you tell us a little bit more about the tenor of the buildings? Um, I know there's been some, you know, uh, ability for some students to come in and kind of get those tours and do the, um, you know, orientation type of things that they would maybe have done last last year or this fall. Um, can you just tell us about how our teachers are doing and, and, and just the excitement in the buildings in terms of returning to learn? Listen, I think with, with the number of teachers that we have, the number of employees we have, uh, you know, um, feelings are, are, are run the whole range. You know, we, we heard in public comment this evening, individuals who were concerned. We have individuals who are, I mean, all of our teachers want to be with their kids. You know, even those who express concern about a return to learn. But we also hear from teachers who are super excited about, you know, today we had, we had kindergarten students sitting in kindergarten class for kindergarten orientation. We had sixth graders doing the same thing. We have a, a member of, of cabinet who has escorted her, her freshman uh, daughter through the school to get a preview for the, for, as a freshman. So, I mean, overall, I think the level of, you know, our, our staff are professionals. Um, they're, 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 they understand the, the, you know, what's asked of them uh, and, and they will always, and always have and always will do what they need to do to help support our kids and to ensure you know, this district continues to be the best district there is, and they will continue to do all that they can to serve all the needs of our families. Um, you know, that being said, the, you know, this is a global pandemic. I don't know about any of you, this is still my first pandemic, okay? And so it's new, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, and so we're doing the best that we can to try to work with our, our association leadership to answer questions that we have, provide the supports that we have. You know, I, from my standpoint, I can't wait. You know, I'll, I'll share a funny story, okay? You know, and I don't mean disrespect to those who have been so frustrated about not getting back to school, right? You know, our timeline regarding return to learn is just anything that can go wrong could go wrong. I go back to October 19th. The County Health Department publicly says, so 100% remote on the day we're supposed to be transitioning, the day we're supposed to be transitioning back, you know, and, and then, so what's my biggest fear? We're in the middle of January right now, right? And on Tuesday next week, the 26th, we're set to have <laughs> kids rolling on buses coming in for our hybrid learning. You know what my biggest concern is? William and Shay, 18 inches of snow, you know, negative 40 degrees, it, it, you know, and so, we're excited. I mean, we want it to happen. We're going to remain optimistic. We believe every, you know, we have all of the pieces in place. I am confident that the mitigations that we have in place that our team has worked through um, are, are create safe learning environments within the guidelines of the Illinois Department of Public Health, the, the CDC and other agencies. So, you know, I think, you know, so, all right. So I, I can't speak for everybody else. But I can speak for me. I'm, I'm excited about this. And I know we have families that have been wanting this since day one. And we are ready for it. And, and it's going to, I'm, so I'm excited about it. 
So the more that we can, um, I know you outlined the new uh, program that you have um, that you're putting forward for um, supporting students and um, families and our staff in um, working under stress and you know positivity and the different tools. The more that we can address those concerns of those that are just, um, you know, you know, expressing the, that unknown and that real real fear. The more that we can address those things and support the better, because I know that as you have stated, all of our staff is very excited to, you know, continue to be with students. And um, so the more that we can address all those concerns that those are met, the better, so that, you know, our families, as they come back, our students, as they come back, um, we know how excited they are to be able to re return to learn in person. And we want all, all people to feel comfortable and, and, and safe as they're heading back. Um, any other questions from the board? Okay. All right, so that will conclude this section of the agenda. We will move on now to uh, President's report. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, a couple things. Um, both Joe and I were able to uh, participate in a panel um, that was done by our diversity advisory, I think council and a variety of um, Dr. Leakes and uh, community member um, Nancy Chin, um, just being able to um, talk with Asian American professionals and District 203 alums about their experience um, in our schools as students. Um, that was a fantastic dialogue that I think really helped to um, you know, express um, things, areas where we can grow and change and um, improve. Um, and I think that really gave students some important guidance. I don't know if Joe has any additional things he wants to share, but I just wanted to highlight that event last week. I thought it was an excellent um, continuing event from our diversity and inclusion department to continue to um, provide learning opportunities so that we can all learn and grow together. Joe, did you have any comment? Uh, no, you, you really hit it all. I, I thought it was a really um, well-run, well-organized event. Um, uh, a, a lot of uh, different perspectives from the, the panelists um, about the, the paths that they took um, through uh, you know, the Naperville schools and surrounding area uh, schools. So yeah, thank you for uh, putting that on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was wonderful, Dr. Leakes. That was a great event. And I think that I'm looking forward to having more of those types of events as, the, as we go forward. Um, the other thing I just want to report, um, both um, Donna Wonke and I were in the Business Partnership Council meeting this morning. We did get a tiny preview of the um, ongoing event that you're, or the, or the ongoing learning that we're all going to be doing as a district to um, support students and families and staff as we enter into this next phase, um, managing stress, um, overcoming challenge. And um, I thought that the presentation, the little preview that we got of the work that we're gonna be doing as a district was just really um, you know, so important. And it, it seems like this is gonna be a real critical resource for families who've expressed concerns about supporting their students to be able to work through um, some of this social and emotional stress together and really um, get those tools. So thank you for all the work that you're doing and thank you for letting us see a tiny uh, preview in that meeting and I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Okay, that will be the president's report. Item 8.06, Board of Education reports. Do we have any Board of Education reports? Okay, I don't see any. Um, so we'll go on to discussion without action and that is item 9.01, Summer School 2021. I'd like to welcome our uh, Director of Summer Learning, Kevin Wokevich, who is here with us this evening. In a moment, he'll update uh, the Board of Education on our recommendations for Summer School 2021. I'll, I'll just share uh, initially, this is our plan for our traditional summer school. In our last Board of Education meeting, we began a conversation with the board about uh, beginning to identify additional uh, supports and additional programming that we'll want to have in place to support lost instructional time, lost learning, and identify gaps, but also how we continue to accelerate and move students forward. Uh, you really kind of those menu of options and opportunities for families um, as we move through the end of this school year, the summer, into the beginning of next year. We won't be addressing those this evening, 
Tonight's presentation is on our, again, traditional summer school model. We will be coming back to the board in a future meeting to present some recommendations, ask for some authorization on expenditure to support some additional programming, but we're waiting until we get some of our kids back in and the in-person learning, the ability to administer uh, some assessments, get a, a more clear sense of what type of supports or additional programming we will need to ensure that we're putting our money in the right places. At the last Board of Education meeting, we did share a number of ideas that we are looking at. Uh, we'll, we'll continue once we get our kids in, have a stronger sense of where, how we're performing and how our kids are doing, and work with our principals and other instructional leaders and our instructional leadership team, come back in the future with some more specific supports. Again, you know, we heard some in public comment to this evening about wanting to know what some additional programming is going to be. It is coming. What you're what we're presenting tonight is not the only programs and supports that will be offered. It is our, just our traditional package. Also share tonight is just for, you know, discussion without action. Uh, we got some information loaded late. There is a second document in there regarding some of our budget information and whatnot. So you may need to take time to review that and come back with questions the next time. But Kevin is gonna walk us through our initial recommendations and we'll respond to questions that you have. And again, there'll be opportunity for further conversation at the next Board of Education meeting. So if we can load the, the, the presentation and information, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to present our recommendations for the 2021 Summer Learning Program. Given the circumstances of the past 10 months, we're looking forward to returning to our regular summer programming and feel our summer learning programs will serve an important role in meeting the SEL and academic needs of all of our students moving into the 2021-22 school year. As part of our blueprint commitment, we revised our summer learning program to increase access for all students, enhance the curriculum and instruction to align with the overall curriculum and offer both acceleration and essential skill-based classes and partnered with community agencies to reduce barriers so that all students could participate. Tonight, I will review our recommendations for the 2021 Summer Learning Program. We anticipate that we will still need to implement COVID-19 mitigation strategies during summer school and have developed recommendations that allow us to fully implement the key mitigation strategies, such as social distancing and face masks, as well as develop some contingency plans to ensure that we can support in-person instruction to the greatest extent possible. At the K-8 levels, due to the shorter summer and need for staff and students to recharge moving into the 2021-22 school year, we are recommending a four-week term that meets five days per week, we will run all courses, but they will be modified to focus on the essential learning standards due to current social distancing requirements and the anticipated number of students participating in summer learning. We recommend utilizing four sites for elementary summer learning. This will allow us to keep classrooms below maximum capacities so more students can receive in-person instruction. We are also recommending that summer learning times at each of our K-8 locations be staggered to ensure that transportation be, can be covered by District 203 drivers and create a minimal need for outsourcing, if any. This will also provide families with students in multiple grade levels who will be providing their own transportation, adequate travel time between buildings. In 2021, we look forward to continuing the successful partnerships we've established with summer learning in the past. We also look forward to reintroducing all of our enrichment courses and introducing one new course to the junior high program, Digital Art. This course will expand on the success of the next level art class offered at the elementary level and, con and continue to help us expand offerings for students who are looking for academic and enrichment opportunities outside of the core curriculum. At the high school, new courses will allow students the opportunities for credit recovery to build essential skills for high school level work and provide additional time for students to engage in research and development for their senior projects. We are anticipating that incoming ninth grade students may need a bridge course into honors math courses due to the pandemic, which is why we added the Essentials for High School Honors Math course. The addition of three enrichment courses 
continues to respond to student and community feedback regarding additional rigor and summer learning. We anticipate being able to run our summer music and science camps in person this summer. Additional PPE is being purchased for traditional music classes this spring and will also be available for use this summer. We've added three new classes to summer music to appeal to students who are interested in music outside of the traditional band, chorus, and orchestra options. These new classes will emphasize STEM concepts while engaging students in hands-on work that explores careers in instrument making, songwriting, and music production. When developing the 2021 summer budget, we have to take into consideration the precautions that need to be in place due to the impacts of COVID-19. This includes the cost of additional elementary sites and site supervisors, additional sections due to classroom capacities, and PPE and cleaning supplies. Some unknowns include the amount of revenue to expect for 2021, so we've built the budget on the 2019 actuals. We're aware that this summer is different with fewer weeks for a summer break, families wanting a vacation with the anticipated release of travel restrictions, and the return of high school sports camps, which might impact our summer enrollment. We continue to be grateful for the board's ongoing support of our summer learning programs, and I'm now glad to take your questions. Okay, questions from the board. Joe. Yeah, thanks for this um, presentation. Um, I think this is a good start to the um, you know, summer offerings. Uh, in, in order for um, families to start uh, planning for their summers, um, do you know when this four week block will be uh, offered? Or is that still kind of up in the air? So the dates that we're recommending are um, June 21st uh, to July 16th. Uh, that'd be for our kindergarten through eighth grade families. And then um, I know we talked about it a little bit last uh, meeting, and it'll it'll come back again uh, when we talk about um, you know additional support for summer learning. Um, but if I remember correctly, some of the summer school offerings, the traditional summer school offerings, um, may be considered for um, you know su uh, financial support as well. Correct. That is correct. That is one of the things that we are looking at as a possible recommendation. Uh, I think one of the things that we showed you was uh, a, a course at no cost. So we haven't finalized all of those just yet, uh, but that will be part of what we look at in the future recommendations. Thank you. I saw Paul's hand and then Christine after that. Hi, thanks for the presentation. I heard you mention all students several times. And my understanding is that in previous summer sessions, uh, the class sizes and number are uh, somewhat constrained by the amount of teachers that we can ask to teach during the summer. If that's the case, how might seats be allocated? Is it first come first serve or some other method? Um, and uh, typically we, you know, we um, haven't had too much of an issue uh, with teachers in the summer. So um, there haven't, uh, uh, you know, that I'm aware of uh, from the past, uh, ha we haven't had any classes that were canceled due to the lack of, uh, of teachers. We have had classes that were canceled due to a lack of interest from, from students. Right. Um, and that's the only reason that, uh, that we've had, uh, you know, class cancellations in the past. And, and while our preference is our own staff and our certified teachers who teach during the school year, at times when we have had to ensure that we, we've hired assistants who may be certified as teachers in the content area, uh, individuals who student taught for us, graduated and are interested in teaching, uh, or at times folks from outside the district. And, and so again, you know, we, we, we do work to ensure that we can run these courses. Um, this will be a year where we, where we will have to monitor staff availability, especially as we look to really expand the programming and whatnot. Again, the right thing, but you know we have to be respectful of just kind of where we're at, right? And so uh, in the number of things that we're offering, but I think as we think about the whole summer, 
introducing perhaps some programming during the school year now and carrying some over into the beginning of the school year should take the pressure off our ability to fill those classes. And I just, one of the other things we've had some conversation about too is if we get to a spot where we don't have staff, we can fall back to live streaming. We do have that equipment now. That would be something that we would be able to do. So our goal will be to serve every single student. We might have to get creative in how we do that, but we do have some backup plans in place should we need to do that. Thank you. Christine had her hand and then Donna. Mine is mostly just a, a comment. Um, I just, I'm, I'm thankful that the administration is putting together what we consider more of our traditional summer school. And then, um, you know, having the enrichment classes, having those options that our, our families are used to having, um, hopefully they'll, they'll go forward with no complications in 2021. And I also appreciate that we're looking at expanding it further um, as we get more and more, um, as we get further into the, the hybrid plan. So um, I, I just appreciate that we, we're, we're, we're trying to not only get our students back up to speed in the summer, if we have to offer those classes, but also giving kids that sense of, I wanna try something new, or I just, um, you know, I wanna maybe get ahead in a credit or two. So thank you. Donna. Um, thank you for the presentation. I typically ask for, um, I know, I think you said that the um, expenses are based off of uh, budgeting from 2019. Is that correct? Uh, the revenue is based off of uh, 2019. The expenses, uh, we uh, tried to estimate with uh, some additional staff and uh, uh, that we'd need, you know, based on um, the mitigation strategies. Okay, so can we, I, I always ask for um, historical data on our budgeting on this too and, and uh, the, uh, what the budget was uh, obviously last year, you know, not, but if we can go back to 2019, what the budget was, what we actually came in at and maybe a couple of years history. I, it's nice to have that in here every time just so we know what the differences is between this and the, up, and the previous years. So I would say 2018, 2019 actual, uh, uh, budget and expend and then actual expenditures so we can see the differences. That'd be great. Okay. And we can, yes, we, we pulled that together yeah. for you last year. So we can, de um, we didn't include obviously 2020 this year because it's not, but we can pull the uh, one that we pulled and provided to you last year that would have had the 2019, 2018 and 2017. Great. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any additional questions from the board, so I'll go ahead and go ahead with mine. Um, first of all, um, I know this is always a lot of work and you've got the added thing of, of adding in new mitigations, new, new ways, new sites, new courses, trying to evaluate from last year. So I know this is a really complicated puzzle, so thank you for your hard work in putting it together. I am also excited that we will have the, uh, more stuff coming in terms of you know, our menu of options like the uh, math camp or the short, Short, shorter term offerings for people. Um, I think that's gonna be a great addition for our um, families and students who may not wanna to commit to a six week, uh, but really would want an intensive. Um, I also wanna compliment you on your new courses. They look great. I love that bridge course. And I think that the ability to offer students the ability of doing their capstone project over the summer is a great idea. They have more time. They can look at, um, you know, you know, really digging in where there it's harder to manage those big projects as a part of the semester. So I think that's great to have that addition. Um, I'm wondering if you can just give us some quick things in terms of um, the sign up. When is the sign up going to be? And um, like, when will you have the exact list of um, all the courses? Uh, pending, you know, board approval on the first, we can have all of that information, uh, you know, posted. Uh, the next day. Um, and then uh, we anticipate uh, um, registration opening on uh, March 3rd. That'll give us uh, enough time to update all of our um, online registration systems and, uh, you know, uh, those pieces to make sure they're ready to go. Okay. Um, and then in terms of looking at the um, students who might want to be remote and sort of our big success this year with the remote summer school, how how exactly will that work for remote students in terms of if, they, if they're wanting that remote option 
and um, you know, high school as well. Um, we're, we're still offering the three online classes that we typically do uh, in the summer. Um, we, we haven't, uh, um, you know, you know, based on the based on where we're at, we we're not offering the uh, online courses to the extent that we we had last year. Um, we feel that the uh, the in person instruction is going to be um, you know the most beneficial, and it also provides um, the most rigor, um, which is what we're looking for, especially in our high school courses, um, which some of those online courses you know may have lacked uh, you know last summer. Okay. So just to continue, um, I know we kind of talked about this last time. It's really hard to evaluate that that, that huge success from last time in terms of, um, you know, people, you know, signed up that might not have signed up because they would normally be on a trip. They would normally be doing more sports. They would normally be doing a whole lot of other things at the same time. Um, it did seem like that was um, something that was very popular. So the more that we can offer those either blended or um, online classes, um, that are rigorous. So definitely hear your point there. Really appreciate that. And we want our students to get the rigor in the summer too. Um, at the same time, it seems like it offered like a degree of flexibility that may still be appreciated for um, people in this changing time period where it's hard to make plans and we don't know what plans will get canceled just based on um, not knowing where the state will be in terms of mitigations for other activities. Yeah. You know, as we determine where we're at as we move closer to the summer and as we look at the additional programming that we may consider, those will all be factors that will be looked at. Okay, great. Wonderful. So, and thank you all. Look forward to reviewing your additional document. Um, and if there's any questions, obviously for the board, um, whether it be budget or anything else that's detailed there, um, we'll go ahead and have, we'll send those ahead so that they can all be answered as a part of that presentation in the next uh, meeting because I know you want to get the action going so that you can you know get people registering and keep moving. Um, any additional questions from the board? Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks for joining us this evening. Appreciate it. Good work. Thank you. Okay, so we will go on right now to item ten point oh one. Well, actually, first item ten discussion with action, and then item ten point oh one school improvement plans. Right, at our last Board of Education meeting, uh, Dr. Patrick Knowlton presented uh, an update to the Board of Education on the school improvement process, school improvement planning process. We provided copies of the school improvement plans for each of our schools. Uh, we have no new information to share this evening. Be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I recommend that the Board of Education approve the school improvement plans as presented. Okay, I see a question from Paul. I see some of the, uh, the projections for improvement are very aggressive, and I'm thrilled about that. But I also hear that we're planning for you know, some remedial work for loss of learning, slide summer or pandemic or otherwise. The current plans say that some of our numbers are gonna go up substantially as early as spring of 2021. Could you help me reconcile these two ideas and how the plans fit into our current information? We maintained um, the aggressive targets that we had in place, you know, based on pre-pandemic. We're optimistic about our school's ability to meet those targets, you know, and Mr. Long, until we really know and have had a chance to evaluate or assess students, uh, difficult to map out or plan more specifically um, where we need to focus in terms of remediating, supporting students that may or may need additional uh, resources. Okay, additional questions from the board? So, so my understanding is just maintaining projections that we had from previous years, as opposed to creating projections that might be more relevant to the situation we currently uh, have? Well, again, we want to look at, you know, ag aggressive goals. Well, education has continued. You know, it, it, it may look different, um, it, it, but however, we do feel, again, by focusing on our essential learning standards, the content within each of our curriculum, we will be aligned to, um, you know, some of the, the assessments that are used for the measurement. So we are, you know, again, we want our goals to be, we want them to be, they're smart, obviously, we want them to, to be reach goals, but we, you know, but we believe they can be attainable. 
Jane, I saw you unmuted. So if there's anything you want to add to that, great. The only thing I want to add to um, Paul's to answer it a little bit more in more detail is we want to wait until we get some of that data. So if we are available or when we can um, administer the map uh, assessment, we'll get some better numbers. And like you said, we may have to make some of those adjustments, but we don't want to make those adjustments until we actually have that data in front of us. And so for now, we will keep those targets rigorous, um, and then we will use that data to inform what our um, adjustments need to ma be made and then what our <laughs> interventions need to be if, if we need to have um, additional ones. Right. So, so in, in, that answers your question. Yeah. In, in the most effective school improvement plans are living documents. You know, they're not just a static document that sits on a shelf. They are living document that respond to the needs of our kids. Uh, when we look at how our kids are doing as we get more data and information, our school improvement teams then have to make adjustments to ensure that they are being responsive, you know, because there could be times when our goals weren't, weren't uh, rigorous enough, you know, that we need to, we can reach farther. And so, uh, you know, again, it's uh, a goal to goal. It, it, it's, a, it's a reach for us. It, it's something we aspire to be to. And I think, again, by, you know, it just speaks to our commitment in this district to continue to reach forward and, and push farther. Okay, I don't see additional, oh wait, sorry I do, Charles. Yeah, no, not, not so much a um, question as a, as a comment and, and um, Superintendent Bridges, you said it before I was gonna, that was gonna be my comment that I actually applaud um, the, um, the team for, you know, maintaining uh, aggressive goals. Um, um, what Ms. Willard, what you said in terms of, you know, until we have uh, the information that indicates otherwise, we should maintain our pace to, to stay on track for the, for the goals that we have. And Dan, to your point that their goals and I think that, you know, you set lofty goals and you achieve lofty things. Uh, and I think that I, I, I just applaud um, the teams and the individual schools and the buildings for maintaining that level of uh, aggression um, to continue to move our students forward. It's critically important. So thank you for that. Donna. Yeah, I think I said this last time too. I'm, I'm excited that the goals haven't changed in the sense that, um, uh, I'd rather aim high and set those expectations high and, and move towards that than to lower our expectations uh, when we, we're not really sure what the effect, I mean, like like Jane said, we still need to get some data on that. So um, so thank you to the staff and to the, each of the individual schools for committing to continue to work hard towards our goals and keep us on progress. And I think as well, in looking at those two documents that we saw from each school, we have the action plan and the improvement plan. As the improvement plan, we have maintained that aggressive, aggressive pace and that rigorous pace so that we can get towards those goals. But I know that our teams have done a lot of work to look at those action steps to make sure that those action steps are gonna get them closer to those goals. And I know that we're still refining that and we'll get more data and that will continue to refine those action steps. But I know, for example, they have brought in lots of stuff about like how to do, you know, various things in virtual context and engagement in this, you know, so I, I also want to commend our teams for doing the work to address all the steps that are going to be needed um, in this new context so that we can continue moving towards those goals. Um, so thank you to all of the school improvement teams who have put those together and we're excited for that continued work and that aggressive growth and continued growth um, from our, all of our schools. Anyone else? Okay, then I will take a motion for the school improvement plans. I move approval of item 10.01, school improvement plans as presented. Second, Gerke. A motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Mrs. Patton. Leong? Aye. Kosminski? Aye. Fitzgerald? Aye. Cush? Aye. Gerke? Aye. Juan Key? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. So we will move on to item 10.02, tax reimbursement account resolution. The Board of Education is really in a unique position um, as a result of um, the, the COVID pandemic last year and, and the unique opportunity for the board to provide economic relief to members of our community to ease the burden during the COVID-19 pandemic. At the last Board of Education meeting, uh, Chief Financial Officer Mike Francis and I presented a recommendation to the Board of Education of adopting a resolution to create a tax reimbursement account for the deposit of 
dollars of funds in directing Mike, our, our, our treasurer, uh, to disperse surplus funds to property owners of record as of January 19th, 2021. Um, every year we work to create a fiscally responsible and attainable budget. But the pandemic meant that some of our projected expenses in areas like utilities and staffing were not fully achieved, which left us in a unique position with some surplus dollars. And at the last Board of Education meeting, we came to you with a number of just recommendations and ideas, some of which we will get to in the future and future board meetings, things like additional programming to support kids uh, in a, a credit of uh, school fees for the school year to help ease the burden. But well, what we're asking for tonight is the board to approve the resolution contained within board docs um, that would again, uh, take $10 million in surplus funds to provide our taxpayers with financial refunds this year. Uh, so Mike has been working with our counties um, and his business office for this process. Again, this is really just a, a, a unique opportunity that we have to, to really, you know, in knowing that we had less than expected expenditures last year, take some of those dollars that would have been used on programming had our, our, our in-person learning continued and then give those back to our taxpayers. And so again, some of the other things that we'll talk about in future meetings include, uh, you know, uh, board policy 420 regarding our fund balance, talking about re refund or credit of, of um, a user of general fees, and then those additional programming. But this evening's action simply is limited to authorizing Mike to create this account, uh, disperse and to disperse the funds. Mike, any additional information to share? Otherwise, we'd recommend the Board of Education approve resolution 2101-01 uh, to create a tax reimbursement account for the deposit of $10 million in funds to direct staff uh, to disperse the funds to property owners in District 203. Just that we're in the middle of uh, gathering the information needed to uh, process this. It will take some time, a lot of effort to work with the counties to do that, but we're uh, well on our way. Once if the board adopts this resolution, we'll be uh, ready to act. Okay, thank you for that review and th that review of sort of the overarching scenario that we have found ourselves in and how we intend to allocate um, those portions to support students and taxpayers. Um, questions from the board? I see Donna. Thank you. Um, not so much a question, more of a thank you. I, I think this is something um, that the board has set as a high priority and uh, looking at uh, just being fiscally responsible at taxpayer dollars and something that we have uh, probably uh, overstated with the administration over and over and over again. And so thank you for uh, putting this together. I know that this is something that uh, uh, almost no other school district in the state is done. So I, I, or at least in the area. And uh, it, it's just really exciting that we have the opportunity to do this. I know last meeting I asked questions in regard to, um, I know community members have asked questions in regard to, um, uh, for some of them, you know, can, can this go towards uh, other, other areas to get students back into school? And I think the answer is, is that we can do this and that. And so I'm excited about looking forward to the things that we can do to help our students uh, through this difficult time, help our parents. And this is a way we can help our community and every community member um, in that regard. So I'm excited. I think it's a it's very commendable on, um, on the part of the administration to get this together. I know it's not an easy task to either. So um, thank you to the staff and, um, yeah, just uh, I, I hope the community realizes that we do here and we and we try to uh, meet the needs of um, our students, our staff, uh, our parents, and of course the whole community. So thank you, Paul. I'm very proud to be a part of this uh, reimbursement resolution. My mm -hmm. hope is that it wasn't more. I see Charles and then Christine. Yeah, just to echo some of the comments, pr proud to be part of this resolution as well. I'm really excited about the opportunity to be uh, returning uh, some of these dollars back to the taxpayer community, especially in light of what's going on. Um, you know, 
I, I think it, it, it demonstrates a, a, a significant amount of reflection on understanding what's happening, understanding the situation. And while um, the reason that we are going to be able to return these dollars to the community uh, is, is one we would have all rather not have ha ha had happen, <laughs> um, I think it's, um, it, it's I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, that uh, we're taking this step. And uh, to Donna's point, it's not either or, but and. So we're gonna be able to do what we need to do to get our students back in school as, as quickly as possible, as safely as possible, and at the same time be able to, to do this. So I commend the administration for um, scrubbing through the budget, identifying uh, this, uh, this figure, and, and that we're gonna be able to return that to the community. So uh, thanks, uh, Superintendent Bridges, to you and your staff, and, and Mike Francis for helping to identify this, and, and, for, and more importantly, for being uh, good stewards and helping us be good stewards of the money so that we would have this to be able to have this surplus to be able to return. So thank you for all of your efforts there. Christine. Charles and Donna have taken most of my comments, but I have to, <laughs> I have to reiterate them. I, I'm proud to be here, like Paul said, to, um, to, to be able to vote on this resolution. And, you know, for the administration, they, they know that this board, at least the four years that I've been here, they know that this is a priority for us, that, that financial responsibility and being responsive to taxpayers, um, whether we're in a pandemic or not. And so the, the fact that um, we, we kind of come to this to get, at the same time, you know, we're not really prodding administration, you know, they, they know this is a priority, priority for us and they keep that in mind. Um, like Charles said, when they scrub through the budget. So I appreciate what, that they listen to us, you know, and they, they know, they, they, they know how we feel as far as how we use our resources. And thanks to Mike and the business office, I know it's a big undertaking and um, it's adding work um, to your plate, but thank you. Thank you for, for, for doing this for our community. Joe? Yeah, I'd just like to echo what um, everyone else has said that the, uh, I'm also very proud to be a part of this, um, you know, being able to give back to the, the taxpayers and um, you know, use this surplus, um, not only you know, to help the community, um, but also later on to help uh, the, the students um, and, and the, the school district families um, with, with the other uh, initiatives. Um, and I want to thank, uh, you know, Mike and his team for, you know, this, this huge effort, um, you know, going through every parcel of land in the school district is no small undertaking. And um, I appreciate the work that everybody's doing uh, to make this, to make this happen. Okay. So as has been reflected, this has been a long-standing commitment of the board. And I would say a, a long-standing commitment of the board and the district and boards before us. And this work has built upon itself um, that this has been one of the things that we look at very, very carefully is how can we lessen the taxpayer burden whenever and wherever possible. So I'm so happy and so proud to be able to be a part of, um, especially at this time when our taxpayers are experiencing economic challenges, additional economic challenges, that we're able to have this timing where with our um, unexpected um, lower than usual expenditures, we were able to have this um, amount of uh, dollars that can be returned to taxpayers. And I would add an additional, so, you know, to support kids going back into school safely, support their social and emotional and, ac and academic needs as we're going back and support our taxpayers. So I'm so grateful that we're able to do all of those things. Um, and I'm just happy to see the reflection of these continued priorities from our board and from our district. Okay, so I think that's everyone, unless there's any other comments or reflections. Okay, then I will take a motion. I move to approve item number 10.02, the tax reimbursement account resolution with the designation of $10 million to be returned to the taxpayer. Go second. A motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll. Kush. Aye. Fitzgerald. Aye. Wanke. Aye. Kosminski. Aye. Leong. Gurky. 
Aye. Okay, the motion passes. All right, so we'll move on in our agenda to item 10.03, policy 7.310, restriction on publications. At our last Board of Education meeting, Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education, Stephanie Posey, updated the Board of Education on Board Policy 7310, something the Board first saw back in January of 2020, and then we put on hold as we uh, navigated through um, our suspension of in-person learning. Uh, Mrs. Posey presented a recommended policy to the Board last meeting, and then has subsequently met with uh, uh, both advisors and students at, at both high schools uh, in the journalism classes, incorporated some of their new recommendations into the policy. I'll turn it over to Stephanie to make some comments. And then I'd recommend that the Board of Education approve uh, Board Policy 7310, Rights and Responsibilities of Student Publications as presented. Stephanie. Thank you. And I'd like to first say thank you very much to both Mitch Martin, Keith Carlson, and the talented and dedicated, well-informed student journalists that I met with. Um, to talk about this policy. They were very passionate about it and we had um, uh, quite a nice conversation about their thoughts and feelings. Um, one of the most important things you'll see that they brought up uh, since, since you saw this in, um, in March last year was that they, they thought that a, a, um, a name that was a little less punitive in nature was warranted. And so I did take the recommendation of changing policy 7310 to rights and responsibilities of student publications. Furthermore, if you look through, um, they did make several suggestions that we did take and those are listed in green along with the, the original changes uh, for both legal counsel and press and some, I believe some board comments as well from last year in 2020. So, um, I hope you've had time to review that. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. And I, I believe that we've incorporated almost everything that the students ask us to. Right, Stephanie, and if I recall um, from our conversation, anything that wasn't incorporated in here was really not in alignment with recommendations from the Illinois Association of School Boards Press Policy Services or not supported by legal counsel uh, on behalf of the Board of Education. So it right. wasn't really necessarily, but the majority of um, student recommendations have been incorporated into this. That's correct. Okay, thank you for that review and thank you for meeting with the students and for all of their work as well and advocacy as well. All right, uh, questions from the board. Donna. Um, I just, I, I think it's very interesting to look at this uh, and uh, just how much of a rainbow it is with the, you know, with all the colors in it uh, really shows the collaboration that went into um, not just legal and press, but like you said, our students and the board. And so um, I, I know this isn't a typical, like, you know, way to, to edit a document, but I love the fact that it's full of color and full of um, collaboration across all those different entities. So, um, and thank you for explaining why there are certain things that we maybe could not have included um, because they were in conflict with the legal um, recommendations from press. And so um, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'll support. Okay, I think you um, muted out, but I think you said you'll support. Okay, so then moving on to Christine. I just would like to thank the students um, for participating. And um, I know this isn't the only time we've had student input on policies or other matters before us. and. I love that they're, they, they take that interest in, in advocating for themselves and for the things that they're passionate about um, in, their, in their school career. So um, I, I just appreciate their, I think every time we have students involved, and this even includes our, our student ambassadors, they're very honest and open, you know, and, and they tell us their real feelings and, and they, I think in many instances can back things up with you know, in this case, um, some different laws and things that are out there. So um, I, I, I love when we work with them. <laughs> it's always a bright spot for me. So thank you. Okay, I don't, oh, Charles. Yeah, I, you know, so Christine, this time you beat me to it. Um, I, I, I just wanna echo what you just said. It's really great when our, when our students get involved. I mean, it's really, the, the mission and the vision of the of the district at work, um, you know, hitting hitting on all five tenets of, of our mission statement. So I think that it's really uh, wonderful to see the level of interest 
um, that our students are playing in this and um, the, the fact that they're, they're voicing their concerns and their advocacy and really driving and pushing to, to help us make us better uh, as a district. So I just um, really uh, appreciate the fact that uh, our students are really to dive in and, um, and, and push for what they believe is the right thing. Okay, I don't think I see any other hands, so I will entertain a motion. Move to approve uh, item 10.03, uh, policy 7.310, restrictions on publications, which is now revised wording. <laughs> second, Gerke. A motion is second, I heard. Please call the roll. Gerke? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Kosminski? Aye. Kush? Aye. Wanke? Wanke? Aye. Leong? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. So we'll move on in our agenda to item 11, old business. We have no old business. So we'll move on to item 12, new business. We have no new business. So we'll move on to item 13, upcoming events. Item 1301, schedule of events. Okay, exciting day. I, I, I think our exciting time, but I just want to make sure that we're clear on the on the calendar here. Uh, the week of January 25th, we transition into stage three of our plan. Actual hybrid instruction will begin on the uh, 26th on Tuesday. Uh, so we're all excited about that. Again, uh, we'll continue to update you throughout the course of the week. Next Board of Education is scheduled for February 1st. I anticipate in working with the board and based on where we're at, we're at uh, with uh, mitigating factors in place and a limit on attendance, we will likely be in person uh, at that next meeting. Uh, and so the remainder of our meetings are there. Uh, I'm sure this calendar will become full of more things as we transition into the next stage as well. Okay, wonderful. All right, so we'll move on to item 14, adjournment. Item 1401, motion to adjourn. I move, move to adjourn, Gerke. Second, second push. A motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Mrs. Patton. Push. Aye. Leong. Aye. Kosminski. Aye. Fitzgerald. Aye. Wanke. Aye. Gerke. Aye. Okay, we are adjourned. Good night, everyone. <laughs>